My favorite comment from Sheila Wynn now, who many of you know, extraordinary scientist in, at MIT, was when she said in a meeting of the uh, National Research Council's uh, Committee on Women in Science and Engineering, and Bruce Alberts was bragging about increasing the number of women in the National Academy of Sciences in the US, and Sheila turned and said, you know, Bruce, I'm going to be happy when there are as many mediocre women in the National Academy as there are mediocre men. <laughs> so I think that uh, goes. Well, anyway, I am going to talk about something a little bit different, although from the same premise. And that is that we really can't afford to waste the talent of underrepresented groups. I think we all agree with that. And I want to talk about underrepresented groups and women in at the intersection of many different kinds of underrepresented groups. But I also want to talk about the notion that really the best way to, or a very important way, to expand the science human capital pool, if you will, of engagement, is really to take seriously Horizon 2020's Science with and for Society, and the National Science Foundation's comparable uh, perspective on broader impacts. To take seriously science with and for society initiates what I will call a science human capital cycle. And that's what I want to talk about very briefly today. That is, I want to talk about the notion that expanding the science human capital pool happens very authentically and seamlessly when we engage science in the work of society. And that, in turn, leads to better solutions for our pressing shared challenges. So how do we think about going from broadening participation, broadening impacts, to broadening participation, to better solutions for our pressing challenges. When we do that, when we unpack what it means to focus on broader impacts or to focus on since science with and for society, from my perspective, what we start with is an emphasis on those societal challenges. So we heard this morning a lot about, and this afternoon, about wonderful rich concepts of science challenges for society that we could begin to unpack. When we do that, we turn to creating much more inclusive communities of experts, and I'll talk about what that might mean. We also, in turn, tend to communicate more broadly about science than we do otherwise. And I will argue that the combination of creating these more inclusive communities of experts and communicating more broadly about science on the ground, as Martina talked about so beautifully in the panel just before, will indeed lead authentically and seamlessly to the kinds of broader talent pool that we need, the human capital, the science human capital talent pool, which in turn will lead to better solutions. So we can think of those are, um, on this slide are the Horizon 2020 pressing societal challenges. But one thing about societal challenges, whether it's energy or it's health or it's climate or it's transportation, it's aging, whatever the societal challenge you're looking at, they tend to come in very messy bundles, if you will. So there's a convergence, for example, across different aspects of the science enterprise. There's a convergence that requires collaborative teams. You don't know whether you're really studying, you're studying the environment or you're studying behavior. You don't know whether you're doing what was called before applied research or basic research. They come in bundles. And that bundling is the thing that I think instigates, in part, the science human capital cycle that I'm talking about, or the broadening of it. So what happens when you're facing creating communities of experts? And I want to put a little bit of quotations around the notion of experts. Because a community of experts if you are, for example, as I am in Newark, New Jersey, and you are dealing with a high poverty neighborhoods, 
with disproportionate ill health in the neighborhood, with polluted, industrially polluted environments. Everything that you do is very complexly embedded on the ground. And when you try to create a community of experts, you are taking scientists, as Neil Lane, the former NSF director says, you are taking scientists out of the laboratory into this world of citizens. And there is a very blurry line between who's the expert and who's, who's the novice, who's the teacher, who's the expert, who's the learner. These kinds of embedded cross-sector communities of experts in these examples, for example, in Newark, New Jersey, we have a very substantial project on healthy aging among African American, in African American high poverty neighborhoods. To make any progress there, we have to engage and do really with to great ends, faith-based organizations on the ground, local neighborhood groups, all kinds of generations, even though you're dealing with aging there, you have to engage children and families at all levels. The scientists that are involved are scientists from behavioral scientists, cognitive neuroscientists. They are scientists dealing with the environment and how it affects health, with nutrition and how it presents itself. So it's a very complicated, robust community of experts. Embedded in that, and we have a similar kind of situation when we try to deal with greening Newark, with deal with the environmental decay and pollution in Newark, with the geochemistry and the environmental contaminants. But at the same time, we need to deal with practice on the ground and with community groups, a large set of community groups on the ground. When you do that, you find that you have automatically engaged a much more inclusive group of experts and expertise. And then the other thing that happens when you try to do that is that you end up communicating about science on the ground through a variety of venues that you had no intention to be teaching about science in, but that in turn, again, embrace a much broader group of potential participants across the age span. So for example, we our biology students in the context of thinking about healthy aging end up doing science videos and, and all using all kinds of social media to talk about brain and behavior. When we think about material science and chemistry, we go in and create glass blowing workshops to talk about the nature to create art. So we go from STEM to STEAM, and in doing that, we embed science directly at the hands of a set of kids who would otherwise not be participating in science and who will now think about it. There's a whole movement, as many of you may know, among incredible astrophysicists to do street astronomy. And this is the sixth street astronomy fair up there. All of this kind of communicating broadly in collaboration with real problem solving on pressing challenges creates a pool for broader participation. The other thing it does, not, not incidentally, is it creates tremendous public support for science. It bridges that gap that was talked about this morning between science and society, between science and the kinds of potential support for society. So for example, when we send out ocean drones in to plumb the depths of the ocean, it helps a lot in my area where in Newark that we have lots of school children who are watching that on the ground in science museums. They will be the future scientists doing that oceanography. Or when two of our biologists study the, the likes and dislikes of roaches and new kinds of roaches to encroach. If you've been in Newark, New Jersey or in New York City, you know that this is an issue. They get tremendous public support, which then begins to engage a broader community of experts about the nature of science. 
What I would argue is that that broader participation then fills out a cycle and leads to better science. So for example, and obviously the European Commission's Gendered Innovation Report has lots of examples of this. An example that we have found very compelling is a lot of work that our cognitive neuroscientists are doing in Palestine with Al Quds. And what they are finding there is that there would be no way without training Palestinian women on the ground as both researchers and as participants in this work, there would be no way to make progress on the tremendously high incidence of depression and anxiety among that population of women in particular, that you simply could not get through to have even the participation you need to do the kinds of studies that Lorna was talking about this morning. So, or this afternoon, one of the arguments that I would make is that when we think about how we incorporate the gender dimension in research and sex and gender in research, that we begin with the notion of how do we bring participants in to those studies. We're gonna have to understand, again, a lot about the presentation, the cultural presentation on the ground of the very things that we're studying if we're going to then expand that pool. So in a sense, this cycle really leads us to what I would call a kind of civic science approach. And Harry Boyd at the University of Minnesota and Augsburg College has said, for example, Civic science aims to tap the immense potential of science and scientists to transform society. The civic science framework recognizes that many talents and different kinds of knowledge, cultural and narrative, experiential, local, spiritual, among others, are integrated in effective collaborative efforts as a community of experts with scientific knowledge on tap, but not on top. Very important question about how we create these robust, inclusive communities of science with and for society. Neil Lane says we must be actively civic and civically active in order to move beyond our words and warnings. In this new civic capacity, scientists and engineers step beyond their campuses, laboratories, and institutes and into the center of their communities to engage in active dialogue with their fellow citizens. And the only thing I would do to amend Neil's comment there is to say with their fellow citizen scientists. Thank you. <laughs>